Amen. It's good to see you. It's good to see you at New Life. Today we get to start a new year and a new service and a new theme. Every year we choose a theme for our church. Our theme for this year is together we can. Yes, we can. Roger, I know you believe because you just responded. Together we can. Thank you. You want to help me preach? We can. Together we can. His wife said, not stay here, Roger. <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, during this series, I'm going to teach you from the book of Nehemiah. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up your Bible to chapter 2 and chapter 3 in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, some of you are familiar with the book of Nehemiah. Some of you have never heard or have never read the book of Nehemiah. Just to get some feedback. How many of you have read the story of Nehemiah? Yes. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. How many of you have never heard the story of Nehemiah? All right, come up here so we can sit down so I can teach you. <laughs> He's like the kids, right? Yeah, Nehemiah. All right, so for the next three weeks, for the next three weeks, we're going to talk about uh, our theme for this year. And I'm getting it, extracting it uh, from the book of Nehemiah. So today I'm going to teach you for the next three weeks. This is the teaching for today. Together we can do more. It's in your outline. Together we can do more. Come on, follow me. Together we can do more. Come on, say with me. Together we can do more. So during my preaching, during my preaching, I'm going to emphasize this. Together we can do more. All right? So when you hear me say together, you're going to say we can do more. Together we can do more. Do you believe that? Yeah. That's the truth regardless if you believe it or not. What you do and what I do and what you know and what I know is good. But when we join our forces Together we can do more. more. All right? So the following weeks, uh, I'm going to teach you next week, not only that together we can do more. Second week is together we can overcome opposition. Second week, yes. second week together we can overcome opposition. In your life, you have faced opposition. 2018, you're going to face opposition. But I'm going to teach you how together we can overcome the opposition. Right now, some of you are facing opposition, and we just began the year. So I'm going to show you how together we can overcome opposition. One of the tactics of the enemy, one of the tactics besides opposing you and, 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 and trying to stop you, the greatest tactic of the enemy is not only to discourage you. If the enemy can get you distracted from God's will and from your purpose, you lose your way. So I'm going to show you how the enemy tries to distract us, but I'm going to show you that together we can also overcome distractions. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I still don't know it all. I'm still not the perfect pastor. I'm still not the perfect husband. I'm still not the perfect dad. I'm in the same boat with you. But I do believe this, that this year God has so much more in store for us than what we can imagine. Now, in the month of April, in the month of April, my wife and I are going to celebrate our 31 year of marriage. All right. My wife and I do not have a perfect marriage, but we have a happy marriage. I love her. She loves me. She cooks for me and I eat it. Now, let me tell you why I say that. I'm not saying that in a bad way. My wife says that I would be the perfect husband if... I knew how to cook. And since I don't want to be perfect, I have not learned to cook. <laughs> All right? It's not that God has not answered my wife's prayer. It's that I have not participated in trying to make that my wife's wish become true. So I haven't learned. You know, you know, we have several cooks and chefs in the church. All right? My wife says, man, get, get close to them. Maybe you can learn something from them. I said, girl, you're a good cook, and that's how we're going to do it. Yeah. Now, the first five, seven years of our marriage was the most difficult times of our marriage. Now, I'm going I'm I'm to be transparent to you. I'm going to open up my heart. The reason it was difficult is because in my life, say the pastor's life, 
in my life operated a spirit of animosity. In my life, because of my upbringing, and because I had not surrendered that part of my life to Christ, even though I was a pastor, even though I was a Christian, for any little thing, I would fight with my wife. Thankfully, I have never hit her because I'd be dead. <laughs> All right? You know, I, I have never hit her, but, but I've been verbally abusive. I've, 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 I've mis- I, in the beginning, I, I was... I was not comprehensive with her. I was not patient. Even though I loved her, I was not loving. And it was very difficult. The the first five, seven years of our marriage, it was very difficult emotionally for us, especially for her. It was very difficult for us financially. It was difficult because we were trying to be the pastors, but at the same time, I, I couldn't get it right at home. Now, why am I telling you this? Because why I'm leading you today. There had to come a point where my wife and I had to decide that we were not enemies. We were a team. My wife was not public enemy number one for me. I was not my wife's public enemy number one. I married her out of love and sadly I was hurting her because I didn't know, I didn't understand her. And it, honestly, honestly, every day it seemed like it, we would fight for everything, for anything. And my mother-in-law had nothing to do with it. <laughs> That's the truth. My mother-in-law, she's with the Lord now. But in the years that my mother-in-law lived, she never got involved in our marriage. Because some of you blame the mother-in-law. Some of you blame the dog. Some of you blame the cat. Look, listen, guys. It takes two to tango. All right? So my wife and I had to make a decision. What are we going to do to understand that together we can do more? So I won't tell you the whole story, but in order for our marriage to flourish, in order for our ministry here in Galveston to flourish, we had to do some things. And that's where I want to lead you. Why? The story of Nehemiah talks about when Nehemiah, God used him, To rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. In the year 586 before Christ. In the year 586 before Christ. The king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Came and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. And by not only did he destroy God's temple. Where the people worshipped. He also destroyed the walls that protected Jerusalem. 586 before Christ. The Bible says that the people of Israel were taken captive under the Babylonian kingdom for 70 years. And after 70 years, the book of Ezra, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, they're contemporary. They go, they go together. One, Ezra rebuilt the temple. Nehemiah rebuilds the wall. And then Esther, God uses her to save the, 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 uh, the, the Jews from being uh, all killed. So... 141 years had gone by. 141 years. Nehemiah had been born when, when his parents had been taken captive. So his brother, his biological brother, when you read the chapter 1, had come from the Babel, from it was now the Persian Empire, modern day Iran. His brother had come from the capital of Sushan all the way to Jerusalem. And when he came back from his trip to Jerusalem... He related the story to Nehemiah. His brother said, Nehemiah, I went back to Jerusalem. And yes, they have rebuilt the temple. But sadly, the walls are still demolished. The walls that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed 141 years ago, they're destroyed. Our people are living in shame. Our people can easily are prey. They're living. They don't have no defenses. They're unprotected. They're exposed to the enemy. So Nehemiah inspired by God, prays for four months, and he says, God, I don't know how to do it. 
Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He had a very comfortable position. He worked for the king. But something touched Nehemiah's heart. And Nehemiah finally one day told the king, King, you know what? The reason I haven't been able to serve you like I serve you is because I feel for my people. My people are living in shame. My people are living defenseless. They can easily be conquered. They can easily be destroyed. Please give me the resources. Please give me authority and allow me to go back to Jerusalem and help my people rebuild the walls. Now, 141 years had transpired and no one had taken up the challenge to rebuild the walls. You know how long it took them to rebuild the walls? Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 15 says that because the people work together because together we can do And because they worked together, what no one had done in 141 years, they did it in record time, 52 days. Now, what does that have to do with you? You don't live in Jerusalem. I don't live in Jerusalem. I live in Galveston. You live on the island. Some of you live on the mainland. What does the walls have to do with you? Let me tell you what it would have to do with you. Your soul is like that wall's. When you don't have walls, your soul is exposed. You don't have defenses in your mind. It's easy. You have the the devil, the enemy has easy access to your mind. And you're going to see how we, this year, we have to build the walls in our souls. We have to build the walls in our life. God wants to use new life to rebuild the walls of others, people that are defenseless, that are exposed, that the enemy has this. Look, look, I have friends. I have, uh, I have friends on the island. I know people on the island that do not know God. They're, they're living in defeat. Their marriages are ending in divorce. Their kids are going the wrong way. And it hurts me to see my friends that do not know God, they don't have no walls. But as sad as it is that they don't have no walls, it's even sadder when I know people in the church that should have the defenses, that has, should be living in victory. The Bible says that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors. And sadly, there are so many Christians at New Life that live defeated, that their minds are exposed to wrong thinking. Their souls, their emotions are hurt. Their wills are not infl- are not controlled by God. Their influence are controlled by the enemy because they don't have walls in their minds, in their soul, in their emotions or in their will. This is why we have to rise up. We have to work together because your family, your soul, your kids, my kids, my life depends if we build those walls back up. Now, let me show you. Let me show you. Let me show you. Let me give you the signs. If your walls are demolished or destroyed. Let me talk about the mind. When the walls are destroyed in your mind, you have wrong thinking. You have uncontrollable wrong thoughts. Not simply suicide. You have consecutive, consistently negative, discouraging, depressing, bitter thoughts in your mind. Because there's no walls. Your mind is easy access to the devil. And if the devil can have access to your mind, he has access to your emotions. And your emotions are all messed up. You easily are depressed. You easily are discouraged. You easily are angry. You're easily bitter out of nowhere. Because your soul, not only does your mind have, does the enemy have access to your mind, he has access to your emotions. And when the enemy has access to your mind and to your emotions, he influences, he controls your will. Do you know why so many Christians come to church but they don't do nothing? Because they're not controlled by the word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Their mind, their soul, their mind, their emotions, and their will are controlled by their problems and by influence by the enemy. You're not demon possessed. Now look around you. If someone is going like this, I would move. (laughs) So, <laughs> look, it's not normal. For, it's normal for you to do this, but if you you're here, uh, you're not the exorcist. All right, we, we will exercise something out of you today. Amen. I don't believe you're demon possessed. I don't believe you're demon possessed. I don't believe you're possessed by the devil. But some of you are controlled. Your mind, your thinking, 
your emotions. Now, you know what happens? Sadly, that trickers down to our kids. The way I think influences my kids. The way I think influences my wife. You know, my, I, I've told you this story. I, I was raised poor. I was, I, I, my mentality, and, and not only because I was raised poor, but, but my mentality thought I, I, many years, I, I, for years, I struggled with insecurity. And the insecurity started in my mind because for years, I had been rejected as a child. My, my father rejected me. And because I, he rejected me, I thought that everybody would reject me. So I, 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 was, I was raised very insecure. And one day my wife told me, if you don't overcome this, in other words, this is what she told me, you can get him out of La Misa, but you can't get La Misa out of him. I, I, was, I was born in La Misa, all right? You can get, God can get you out of the ghetto, but sometimes he struggles to get the ghetto out of you. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know someone yeah. that, 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 that God got it, but, but it, he's trying. He, try. So my wife sat me down and says, look, if you don't change your way of thinking, and if you don't t- change your way of speaking, now, I, I didn't cuss, but you've heard me say this. I could be a millionaire. I could have been a rapper. Because in Spanish, I would always tell my wife, no se puede, no tenemos, no se puede, no tenemos, no se puede, no tenemos, no se puede, no tenemos. We don't have, we don't have, we can't do, we can't have, we don't have, no podemos, no se puede, no puede. For everything that my wife wanted to do, I said, no podemos, we can't do it. Everything, no tenemos, we don't have. Because I was raised with impossibility thinking. But how many of you know that with God, nothing is impossible? Now, my wife told me this. If you don't change your way of thinking, it's going to affect the future of our family, our kids. And you as a pastor is going to affect the future of the church. So I had to learn, I had to rebuild the walls of the right thinking by the word of God in my mind, in my emotions. And this is where I want to lead you today. Together, we can do more when we surrender to God's will, to God's plan, to God's work, to God's task. We can do more. So let me me teach you how we can do more. Number one, write it down. They could do more. There's four things, four things that I want to teach you this morning about teamwork. The first thing is we can do more when we work as a team. Now, you've heard this. You've heard this before. Team does not have an eye. You hear that? It's not about I. It's not about your eye. It's about us. It's about we. And see, thank God for what we've accomplished today as a church. But we can do so much more if we learn to work as a team. So let's read. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 2. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. And its gates have been burned with fire. 141 years it had, it had, it had remained ruined. Come, he says, let us. Notice what he says. Let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he says, and we, he didn't say I, he said, we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, notice what they replied, let us, come on, shout it out, let us. See, they understood that together together they could do. Oh, some of you are falling asleep. Together we can do. That's the reason they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this great work, and when Sambalot, the Aaronite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, and the official, uh, uh, the Ammonite official, and Jassim, the Arab, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this that they're doing, they asked. Are they rebelling against the king? See, they were trying to intimidate him. They thought that they were rebelling against the king. The only reason they were doing it is because God had inspired Nehemiah. And Nehemiah had gotten the king's permission to come back. So in essence, they were rebelling. They were doing what God wanted to do with the favor of the king. And I'm telling you, what we do in new life is because God says we can do it. And we're doing it for the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Nehemiah answered. Nehemiah answered what the enemies were saying. He says this. I answered them by saying, the God of heaven 
will give us success. And if God has given new life success in 2018 and more, God will help us do what we need to do. The God of heaven has been with us. The God of heaven is with us. And the God of heaven will continue to be with us. I said the God of heaven has been with us. The God of heaven is with us. And the God of heaven will continue to be with us because together we will have success because together we can do more. The God of heaven will give us success. Notice this. We. He didn't say I. He says we. The servants will start rebuilding. But as for you, he told Nehemiah, Nehemiah told him, we will start rebuilding, but as for you, he's telling your enemy, his enemies, you have no share in Jerusalem or claim or historic right to it. So Nehemiah comes back and he begins to relate to them what God had showed him when he was afar. And by him communicating, but by him sharing, they got involved, they got excited, they got encouraged, and they began to build. Now, one thing that I want to highlight to you this, in the book, in this chapter, chapter 3, 28 times you will find these next verses. Notice this, we, I highlighted them purposely. The man of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakor, the son of Mirai, built next to, next to them. Now, the bottom part. And Barak, the son of Meshahabel, made repairs next to him. Sadok, saying of Bana, also made repairs. The next verse. I want you to notice this. 28 times in this chapter, you will find the phrase next to him, after him. In other words, they were working side by side together because they understood if they were going to repair the wall, it was a tax too big for one person, but together they could do. The reason they were able to do it in 52 days, in spite of the fact that the gates had been demolished and had been destroyed for 141 years, is because they worked as a team. And if this year we're going to advance, and if this year we're going to accomplish more things, not only in our family, but in our church and in our community, we must understand the power of teamwork. Together, we're better. Together, we're more effective. Together, God receives the glory. Divide it. We fall, but united we stand and we conquer. And not only will God help our personally, but not only will God bless our families, new life will continue to help other persons rebuild their walls. Because it's not only about building my walls, there's people that need our help to rebuild their walls also. But we got to work side by side. Not only will you find this phrase next to him, after him 28 times, to show is the power of teamwork that had to work together. The other thing that you will find, 35 times you find the, the phrase repaired, reconstructed. Now, when you repair and when you reconstruct something, you make it better, you make it stronger because you want it to look better. Yeah. A week before Christmas, a week before Christmas, I came to church and I noticed that, that glass door in the entrance, something happened. And I said, oh, oh, did, did Sammy or Cynthia do something to the... No, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. So I walk in, I said, I said, Cynthia, did you notice the door? It, 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 it's, it's not right. We can't close it. It didn't close right. And then the other, the, the other half, you know, the other half of the door, glass door, you have to move uh, so you can open it. And, and those locks or whatever it's called weren't working. So I called around and I said, yeah, a new one will cost you $5,000. I said, okay, let me go to uh, Pearland. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about, Pearland, right? <laughs> the flea market. I didn't go to Pearland. So we called different companies, and finally, I had to go, and I said, hey, this is what's the matter with, uh, with, with our door. I said, yeah, we can replace it. We can fix it. He said, we can fix it. If you want it replaced, it costs you 3500 to 5000 Hallelujah, Lord. Touch someone that wants to. No. So I said, how much is it going to cost us to repair it, to make it better? He came out, and he said, oh, it costs you 250 bucks. Let's do that. Let's do that. You, need to, you don't need to pray about that. Let's do it. So for $250, the guy came out for three hours. He took out what was, what was wrong, made the door flimsy, weak. Not, most of you didn't notice it. If you go outside, you're going to notice that on one side, the hinges or the, the, the whatever it's called on the outside, right side, it's new. The other one is, is old. Because the old is working fine, and when it's working fine, you don't have to mess with it. 
<laughs> I know that's right. No, that's not, that's not right. We're going to get fixed. The other thing that most of you haven't noticed, and you're going to notice it when you walk out, there's another thing that's missing. When you walk out, notice to the right side, there's a piece of tile that has been missing for over six months. It looks awful. If it was my house, it would have already been fixed. If it was your house, you would have already noticed and fixed it. But see, because it's God's house and, you know, it's, it's church, uh, let the pastor deal with it. Sorry, pastor. <laughs> now, the reason we haven't fixed it is not because we don't have the money. The reason we haven't fixed it, they discontinued that tile. So yesterday, the guy that does the maintenance at church, I asked him to come and do some stuff. And, you know, we have a, that big AC down there, up downstairs and the outside. There's a storage area. And he came for about... <laughs> Poor guy, five, six hours, took out everything and put back everything back in place. And I came around three and he said, hey, pastor, hey, before you leave, I want to show you something. He goes, what do you want me to do with these old tiles? I said, which ones? He, so he brought them out. Inside of there were ten tiles that were left behind in case we ever needed them to replace them, to improve something. And those are the tiles that we have not, I have not been able to find. Now, we didn't fix it yesterday. We didn't fix it yesterday because we need a tile guy to do it. We found the tile. Now we got to find the tile guy. Now, <laughs> that's funny, right? Ah, we found the tile. Now we got to find the tile guy. <laughs> now, in a couple of days, hopefully by this week, we're going to fix that part. As you leave out, some of you are going, God bless, God bless you. God bless you. Now, why are we going to repair it? You repair something, even though it's small and insignificant, to make it look better, to make it stronger. And there are things in your life that are, have been small, but you haven't repaired. And that's why your thinking, and that's why your marriage, and that's why your relationship with God is not what it's been. But if together we repair and make strong what we, make the, what we need to do strong and we work as a team, you will realize that together we can do more. Not only that they work together, but they work to repair. Now, this is the story. In your outline, in your outline notice the bottom part. I put a graph, more or less, of how the walls were rebuilt. And in this chapter, you're going to find over 50 names of persons and families that rebuilt the wall. The task, guys, was too big for one person. Nehemiah knew that even though God was with him, he couldn't do it by himself. Listen to this. God will never do nothing on earth without people. In order for God to save you, he had to send his son. Everything God has ever done on earth, he has used people. Not only one individual, a team of people. And Nehemiah understood that even though God was powerful and even though the king had given him the resources, Nehemiah understood that the task of rebuilding the wall was too big for himself. That's why he used and he asked for other people to help him. And now you see in the map, there's names and there's parts from the wall. Let me illustrate it this way. From here to that door, the, the whole wall had ten gates. So from one gate to the other gate, either half of the way or the whole way, one person, one family took up the task to repair their part of the wall. And then from the other gate to the other gate, another family rose up and they repaired the other part of the wall. Now, this is an amazing thing that I want to teach you. The second thing that I want to teach you from this verse is this or this passage is that they use diversity. They united diversity. The second thing that I want to teach you is that if we're going to do more, we have to understand that even though we're diverse, but as one people, we must unite to do one common thing. Now, let me tell you what I mean. All these people that, we re that, that God used to rebuild the wall, they were not expert in constructing walls. Let me say it again. I hope no one gets offended. I hope no one gets offended. Most people that do walls, and I'm not talking about Trump. Oh, I won't go there because you'll, you'll get offended if I say it. 
<laughs> let me say it this way. Let me say it this way. Be- after the hurricane, after the hurricane. <laughs> no, you won't understand that either. <laughs> let me go back to my wall. Let me go back to my wall. No one on the wall, no one that rebuilt the wall had the expertise to construct walls. They didn't. Listen to what I'm about to say. God is not looking for you to know everything. They didn't have all the abilities, but they were available. You might not know everything, but if you're available, you're a candidate to be part of the team. Now, the other thing is this. They were from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Some of them were governors. Some of them had very good paying jobs. Some of them were regular people. And see, and what makes the church, it's not that if you work in an office and if you're a doctor and if you're a nurse or you're just a janitor. Listen, when you, we join our different backgrounds, when we join what we know and when we understand that what we're doing is for, our, for God and for God's kingdom, that's when united we can do more. So let me show you this. Let me show you this. Let me show you this. The Bible says that they were different. The, the first ones that stood up were the religious leaders and the Levites. In uh, Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 8, notice this. The Bible says that Uzel, the son of, of Harahiah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. What was Uzel? He was a goldsmith. He worked with gold. And then the Bible says, and the next section was repaired by Hanaiah, one of the perfume makers. One of them was a goldsmith. The other one was a perfume maker. I don't know what a perfume, I don't know how do they make perfume. I know how to buy it. Cologne, not perfume. It would be weird for me to wear perfume, right? I buy perfume for my wife. But can you imagine a goldsmith and a perfume maker? Now, I, wanna, I want you to notice this, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 12. Shalem, son of Halohesh, ruler in, in, the, in the original, it says governor. He was a governor. There was governors from different sections of the city. Shalem, the ruler or the governor of half the district of Jerusalem. Notice, one of them was a goldsmith. The other was a perfume, a perfume maker. This guy was a governor. He was a ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired the neck section with the help of his sons even women even girls even teenagers got involved you know why women got involved because there were men that weren't willing to do their pitch that weren't willing to do their job and it's sadly many times in church men are not willing to stand up not a new life we have a lot of you notice that we have a lot of men Dude. Now, I don't, I don't want to be sarcastic, but this is the truth, guys. I, what I want to show you is this. Even though one of them was a goldsmith, he didn't know anything about constructing a wall. He says, man, this is for my and my family and from our city. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to rebuild the wall. Yeah. I don't care if, I, I only learn how, if I've only worked with gold all my life. The other guy says, you know what? I don't care if I only make perfume. I might be stinking from now on. <laughs> now I know I'm gonna, how I'm going to use the perfume in my house. <laughs> then the other one, even though he was a governor, the Bible says he constructed the next section with the help of his daughters. daughters. Now, there's another verse that I want to read to you. Verse 5. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Now, notice this. Go home, read the chapter. You're going to find all these difficult names to pronounce. And if you have a child, I know you're not going to name them by one of these names. Because if you can't pronounce it, no one is going to be able to pronounce it. But I, wanna, I want you to show you, I want to show you this. All the names of the persons and the family that got involved, you're going to see their names. But these guys, it says this, and the next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but they're nobles. The nobles, commentary says, 
were people that had a better way of living, that had succeeded in life, that had accomplished things. It says they were not willing, the, 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 the new version says they were not willing to do their part. They were not willing to pitch in. Now, please look, look, at, look at me. What do you do? When God has saved us all. Now, if you're not saved, that's cool. If you, if you came today, that's cool. But what do you do when God has saved you? And in your life groups and at church, someone is not willing to stand up and do their part. Did it only happen at his time? That it only happens in our time? It has happened throughout history. People forget what God has done for them. And somehow, some way, we believe that we're too good to get involved with other people. So my question to you, are you going to continue to be some of those that don't want to pitch in, don't want to do your part? Or it doesn't matter if you're a woman, you're a daughter. It don't matter whatever task you do. Maybe you work at an office. Maybe you're a janitor. Maybe whatever. I don't know what you do. But the truth is this, guys. What makes the difference is not what, what makes us united. It's not our last name. All of us have last names. It's not the color of our skin. It's not our level of education. It's not how many degrees we have. What unites us is the blood of Christ that was shed for you and was shed for me. And together, if we work together and we unite in spite that we're diverse, you do a different job. I do a different job. Even though I'm the pastor, but hey, okay, hey, let's get messy. Let's do this together. God's walls has to be rebuilt. It depends for the future of our kids, for the future of our family, and also for other people's future. You have to get involved because together we can do more. Now, this is the truth, guys. This is the truth. I've been a pastor 27 years here. And there's people that have never d done anything. And there are people that never pitch in. Well, I've got good news. Nehemiah didn't stop because of them. And we're also not going to stop even if you don't want to pitch in. Because when you don't, this is the truth. I've seen it. When you don't want to pitch in, God will bring a drug addict. God will bring a prostitute. God will save him. God will transform him. And what you don't want to do and what I want to, want to do, what I was supposed to do, God will bring in someone that you never could do it, and God will use them to do what we were supposed to do. So whatever you do, maybe you're, uh, you work in an office, you're a secretary, maybe you're a chef, maybe you're a janitor. In here, we don't have titles. In here, we're a team. And if we work together, we can do more. The third thing that I want to teach you, the third thing that I want to teach you is this. We must understand that if we are going to do things together, we must understand the importance of starting at home. Let me, let, me, let me say this. Let me read this quickly. You're going to find this over and over and over. Come on, give me the, the verse, Nehemiah. Adjoining this, Jehadiah, son of Raphamath, made his repairs opposite his house. The next verse. Beyond them, Benjamin made repairs in front of their house. Notice this, in front of their house. Besides his house, each in front of his house. Listen, before you can help someone else's walls be built, you have to rebuild your own house. Yeah. You have to start at home. Yeah. Before I can help you rebuild, well, those of you that have ever flown, what, what, do, they, what do they tell you if, if, if there's an emergency? He said, they always tell you, put the oxygen mask first on you because if you try to help someone else, you might die in the process. Put it on first, then help someone else. Now, this, this is important. We have a saying in Spanish. We have a saying in Spanish. And I, I, I tried to translate it. Let me see if I get it right. The saying is this. Candil en la calle, oscuridad en la casa. You can be a light post in the street, but there's darkness in your home. In other words, I can be so loving to you. Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm Pastor Gomez. I'm glad, I'm glad to see you. But my wife, man, I speak to her and I humiliate her to my kids. I speak to them. I don't. Because it's so easy.
to put a front. How you doing? God bless you. How are you today? Good morning. How are you? I wake up and I say, oh, by the way, I've slept. I, I haven't slept with my wife for two days. <laughs> Caleb, Caleb, thank God for Caleb. Uh, I mean, sorry, thank God for Lily, because Lily has never told me this. But Caleb was the last kid that left our house. And when we, he saw that me and my wife sometimes would pray, to, I mean, argue, I mean, pray, I mean, argue. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb would always go, Ooh. we don't have a dog. That means we don't have a dog house. But Kayla would say, ooh, someone's sleeping in the dog house tonight. <laughs> and since we don't have a dog, and when I, he saw me, I say, who let the dogs out? <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I talked I talk to my oldest kid. I talked to my oldest kid today, uh, uh, Friday, and my oldest kid says, Dad, you remember when I was 14? You got very mad at me. I said, what did I get mad at? Because I said, hey, what's up, dog? I said, I'm not your dog. I'm your dad. Listen to this. I haven't slept with my wife for two nights because she has the flu, and the doctor told her, and she advised me to not be close to her because so, I don't want to get the flu. <laughs> but listen, it'd be sad that my wife gets healed by tomorrow, and I keep sleeping on a different bed. Y'all look very serious because some of you have slept in the doghouse. <laughs> Let them out. Let me be candid and let me be real, guys. I've been married 31 years. And I'm going to I'm going to show you when new life begins to grow. I'm going to open up my heart and I'm going to show you how how life how new life began to grow. When my wife and I came to Galveston, our oldest son was 3 years old. That means we've been married 4 years. My wife and I had been married 4 years. I just told you in the beginning that our, more difficult, our most difficult years were our fifth through our seventh year. There was always animosity. There was always fights in my marriage. We always had financial problems. But one day, my wife and I, guided by God, went to Dallas. And at a Motel 6 in Dallas, Texas, my wife and I sat down. Actually, we knelt down. And I made a list. I made a list. And on one, and on one side... I wrote down everything that I needed to ask my wife for forgiveness. And on the other side, I wrote down the things that I needed to forgive her, what she had done to me. So on our seventh years of marriage, our seventh years of marriage, we knelt down and we forgave each other. We understood that if God was going to bless our marriage, that if God was going to bless our children, and if God was going to bless our church, it had to start in our home. It had to start with us, the pastors, first. You know why new life could never go? Because our hearts were hurt. We were wounded. And wounded people hurt people hurt people. And all I was doing was hurting my wife. So we forgave each other. And that day, in that hotel room, to my oldest son, we also asked him for forgiveness. Forgive us the way we've acted towards you. And we asked God for forgiveness. Say, God, forgive us. I don't want to go to San Antonio. I'm not going to tell you the story. I, don't want, I want to stay in Galveston, God. And we will do whatever it takes to see new life grow. God, you know what happened? In that hotel room, God not only forgave us, he healed our heart. He healed our marriage. And God can only work through healed people. Because when you are hurt, you only hurt people and you will never flourish. You know why some of you can't dream God's dreams? Because you're hurt. You have the wrong thinking. I had the wrong thinking. I was hurt. I was rejected. You know why you go back to your old lifestyle? Because you give up on God in spite of the fact that God will never give up on you. You know why your parents struggle with you? Because you haven't had an encounter with God. Because when you have an encounter with God, you won't release your salvation. You won't give up. You won't, you won't come down. You're gonna, I'm going to show you that next week that Nehemiah didn't come down from the wall. And the devil will do anything to try to bring you down. Don't come down. Don't please the devil. But we understood, my wife and I understood, that if God was going to do something in our church, in this city, in this community, in our church, 
it had to start in our home. Why am I saying this? Because you come to church, but you don't live in church. What happens in your home is what you bring to church. If you walked into my home, what would you perceive? Would you perceive love? Would you perceive harmony? Would you perceive that we're truly a Christian home? What if I walked into your home? Forget about me. Forget about you. What if Jesus walks into your home today? What would he perceive? See, because church does not start in this building. Church starts at home. Church starts at home. Let let, let me be honest, guys. Let me be honest. You know why some of our kids don't want to serve God? Because we say one thing at church and we live another way at home. I'm going to be honest. I get upset. My Lily seen me mad. But my kids can tell you that what I preach from this pulpit, that's what I live in the home. I'm not perfect. Sometimes I mess up. But my kids know that in my home, I told my kids, as Joshua said, choose who you are going to serve. But it's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So before we continue to do another Discover Life, let's start at our home. This year, begin in your home. Work in your marriage. Repair your marriage. Repair your love for your wife. Repair your love for your children. Repair your love for your God. Repair your love for your church. It has to start at home. And if we start at home, together we can do more. Finally, 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 I want to teach you this. God never forgets. God, understand, God never forgets names. How many of you are bad with names? How many of you are bad with names? How many of you think I'm good with names? I'm good. But this morning, yeah, I see everybody thinks except Josefina. Now I know. Uh, Josefina, I say, uh, uh, Ramon, Lisa, she goes, what's my name? I go, oh, you're a cousin, right? No, I said, she said, what's my name? Woo. I said, uh, Maria. And, and she goes, uh, what's your wife's name? Maria? No, no, I'm not. Oh, Josefina. See, I'll never forget your name now. Josefina. Now, I'm pretty good with names. I'm pretty good with names. Out of, out of this row, I can probably get half of y'all. Out of this row, I can get half of y'all. Out of this row, I can get half. So, oh, those of you upstairs, I don't know you. Those of you up there, I don't know you. <laughs> There's no one up there. There's no one up there. There's no one up there. They're over here. Oh, he doesn't know anybody. There's no one up there. <laughs> okay. I'm pretty good with names. Honestly, I'm pretty good with names. You could be better than me, and I hope you are. But this is the truth, guys. God is very good with names. Not only he is very good with names, this is what the Bible says, and and I don't care to ask God. The Bible says in the Gospels that God counted, knows exactly how many hairs we have, and I'm not asking him that no more. I don't know. I've I've lost the count, and I hope God loses the count. But the Bible says God knows exactly how many hairs we have. In other words, God knows us to the T. God knows my name. God knows what's in my head. God knows what's in my heart. God knows everything about me. Now, why why am I saying God never forgets names? Let me show you this. As you go go through chapter chapter 3, you're going to find a big list of all names. Now, listen to this. You will never find the name of Nehemiah in chapter 3. Read it. You never find the name of Nehemiah. You never find it. Nehemiah listed, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the names of everyone that pitched in, the names of every family that helped. You'll find over 50 names. Now, why am I telling you this? Because most of us think that God forgets about us. Let me show you this. The Bible says in Nehemiah, Nehemiah says this. Not because God forgets, but God, Nehemiah told God. Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 19. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. Nehemiah says, God, please remember me with favor for every... You think God had forgotten what Nehemiah had done? But we think, we we tend to think 
that God forgets. When Nehemiah finishes chapter 13, he says this. The last verse in chapter 13, he says, I also made provisions for contributions of wood at design times and for the first fruit. And then he get, again, he says, God, remember me with favor, my God. Remember me with favor, my God. Now, let me be concluding by sharing this story from Joseph. The Bible says in Genesis, those of you that are familiar with Joseph's story, Joseph was sold as a slave. He's in prison. And while in prison, the baker and the cupbearer that work for Pharaoh are jailed. Joseph interprets their dreams. One of them was killed in three days, and the other one was released. The cupbearer was released. And notice what Joseph asked him. He, he, Joseph tells him, but when all goes well with you, when all goes well with you, remember me. When all goes well with you, remember me. And show me kindness. Mention me to the Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. In verse 23, he says, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. <laughs> but what do you do when you help people and they forget about you? Please, please listen to me. If this year we're going to accomplish more things, you have to realize this is not about you. This is not about me. This is not if you have my back and I have my back. And yes, we have to encourage each other and all this. Listen to this. All of us, all of us forget what God has done for us and what people help us. You know why David in Psalms 183, he says, Bless my soul and do not forget any of his benefits because all of us not only forget what God has done for us, but we forget what people do for, help us. Look, look, honestly, I could be the most bitter person in, of all of you in here. 20 years ago, I helped a family that was going to go through a divorce. Their marriage, their kids, their, their marriage was saved. You know what happened a year later? The lady forgot what we did for her, and she left saying all these things about us. She forgot. Now, I could have held that grudge, and I said, God, I helped her. No, no, no. Listen to this, guys. Don't harbor things when people forget to give you things because you're going to become bitter, and that's going to stop you from what God is going to lead you because all of us, listen, even me, one day I'm going to forget your name. I won't forget Josefina. <laughs> Josefina, I'll never forget your name again. <laughs> I'm going to look. Oh, Josefina, that's my wife's name. How can I forget it? But when people forget about you, God will never forget about you. Why? This is what the Bible says. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6. The Bible says in Hebrews, God is not unjust. He will not forget. He will not forget your work and your love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. People might forget, but God never forgets. I said people might forget, but God never forgets. Now, some of you some of, know some of these people. Some of you don't. These are 27 people, 27. Some of them are family members. Some of them are. I'm just going to go through the list. There's Eugenia and Rosalva. There's the Perez. There's Ronnie and Fabiola. There's uh, Miguel, Monica, Babis, Linda, Chela, Lupita, Chabelita, Mari, Contreras, Ramos. The youngest there is me. <laughs> There's Sule, Omar, 
and Cynthia. Cynthia's the youngest of them all. You saw her? You saw her? Omar's the youngest. How, how old is oh, I wanna, Where's Omar? He's back there already? Get out of here. No, not right. No, no. Omar wasn't even born when, when we came to Galveston. Now, every year we have an appreciation dinner. Some of you were here this year. Every year we appreciate all the volunteers. And every year we give different recognitions to, to the most uh, kindness, to the most joyful, to the most whatever. But every year we choose out of every three services, three individuals that we believe stand out the most in their serving. We choose a lady, a, a female, we choose uh, a man, and then we choose a young person. The one that we believe that, that has done the most throughout the year. And in the previous year, some of you have been chosen. This year, 2016, 17, I told my staff, this year I want to recognize all those persons and those individuals that for 15 years consecutively have served, have never given up, had not gone discouraged. And I could tell you the stories of, even, of, of many of them. Some of them have lost kids of cancer. One of them lost her husband. I could tell you stories. Some of them don't have legal papers. But my God, they love God. They love this church and they love what they do. They don't have the pain. They don't have the jobs that you have. But they have a God that has been able to supply for them. I could tell you story after story. One lady is over almost 75 years old. And for the past, since she was 60 or 59, she's been serving. Why? Because they understood that together we could do more. Now, let me, let me tell you why I want to highlight them. Let me tell you why I highlight them. Because these were the individuals that not only prayed, not only gave, but they worked to do that church and to do, you know, that we built this one with our own hands. We built this one with our own hands. They literally, literally, not only with tears, by sweat and blood, they paid the price and they haven't given up. So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Those of you that are volunteers at New Life, I want to encourage you. Keep serving. Don't get discouraged when someone doesn't want to pitch in. It happened in Nehemiah's time. It happens in our time. The show must go on. The show must go on. So don't give up. Keep serving. Keep loving God. Because together we can do more. Keep connected to your life group. Now I want to challenge the rest of you. I want to challenge the rest of you. Thank you for coming into church. Thank you for being here at church on Sunday. But being a Christian is not only showing up on Sundays. Being a Christian is being involved. It's getting your hands dirty. It's giving back to what you freely receive, freely give. When are you going to pitch in? When are you going to get involved? Now, why am I challenging you? Why am I challenging you? Because we don't want to leave you behind. I don't want you to lose what you've lost for the past years of your life because you haven't stepped up. So I'm not going to force you, but I will challenge you. Listen, listen to this. Some of you have stopped serving. This year, come back to serve it. Now, let, let me talk to you ladies. Let me talk to you ladies. Do you know that right now we need, kid, we need help with you ladies, with the babies? And we can't find help because everybody wants to listen to the pastor sing on Sundays. I'm glad you like my singing, but there are precious kids. There are precious babies that need you. Oh, pastor, are you talking about me because I don't want to say. Guys, there are kids, there are people, there are ushers, there are parking cars. There's so much that we could do more. It's not about parking cars. It's about the people that God loves. <laughs> so I challenge you, step up. If you have stopped coming to church, this year step up and become consistently attending church. If you haven't connected to a life group this year, I challenge you, get connected to a life group and stay connected. If you stop serving, come back and serve. We don't want to leave you behind. You know, in Mexico, there are some comedians like the Three Stooges. Y'all remember the Three Stooges? Curly, Mo, 
And what was the other guy's name? Larry. Larry. You sure? All right. I just want to make sure. In Mexico, there are some comedians that are almost like the Three Stooges. And my wife says that they were hiring. And there was a big line. There was a big line of people that had the resume and, and they wanted a job. And one of these comedians, not the Three Stooges, the, the, they call them the Polibosos in Mexico. Everybody, he says, man, this guy is a bum. He's lazy. He don't know, do, he don't know how to do anything. Why is he a lie applying for that job? So finally, after about two or three hours, he finally, of standing and getting uh, uh, standing in line, he reaches the office where they're doing to the interview. And the guy that's interviewing says, "Okay, sir, why are you here? Why did you come? What can you do?" And he goes, "Oh, I was only in line, and the only reason I came today is to tell you, please don't count with me." <laughs> that's all. I'm not looking for a job. I, was, I saw people in line. I got in line, so whatever you're doing, don't count with me. <laughs> Are you going to continue to be someone that tells God, God, don't count with me? Are you going to stand up and say, God, count with me? I was a drug addict, God. I was lost, but you saved me. You transform me. I don't know how to do a lot of stuff. I don't have the best abilities. I'm not the best singer. I'm not the best speaker. I'm not the best. But God, if you can do anything with me, count with me this year, God. Count with me. I want to continue to do. I want to continue to believe that there's so much more that you want to do in your life. Count with me. So can God count with you? Can new life count with you? Or are you simply going to show up and say, hey, what? I'm here, Pastor, this is it, but don't count on me. That's all right. That's all right. Keep coming. But the truth is this, guys. God's work was never done with people that didn't step up, that didn't pitch in. This job was done because everybody that didn't know how to, what to do were willing to do even what they didn't know what to do because together we can do Last night I was in my office. Listen, please stand, please stand. Last night was in my last night I was in my office. And I was reminded. I was reminded why I'm a pastor. The Lord remind me why he brought me to Galveston. The Lord only saved me because the walls of my life were demolished. And by his grace and by his love, God little by little began to build walls of security, of love and purpose in my life. And the only reason God brought me to Galveston, I'm not Nehemiah, my name is simply David. I wasn't going to be real build walls. Listen, I'm doing something more important than Nehemiah. We're doing something more important than Nehemiah. We're not building bricks. We're building lives. We're building the future of children. You know why I dared to believe to build that building? You know why I dared? My kids will never, maybe will never come back. My kids will never come back, maybe. But I don't care if they don't come back. Well, I do care. <laughs> what if they never come back? What if my kids never come back? That's all right, as long as they're in God's will. But I didn't build that building thinking of the future of my kids. I believe God because God has so much for the future of your kids. And if you understand this, if we work as a team, if we unify, unify our diversity, if we start at home, if we understand that God remembers your name, one day Lupito, Kiyong, Rogers, Mark, Cynthia, Ronald, whatever your name is, God remembers your name. I might forget your name, but God will never forget Josefina's name. Lily, never forget. God will never forget that you're Lily. God will never forget your name. And what I do is because God one day remembered me. So this year, this year, are you just going to continue to show up? That's fine. 
We're not going to run you. We're not going to force you. Or can God count with you this year? Can new life count with you this year? Can you say, you know what, Pastor? Enough is enough. I don't want to be left behind. I don't know what I have to do. But, Pastor, if I need to clean restrooms, clean restrooms. Pastor, if I need to wash, Pastor, if I need to invite you out to eat. No, you don't have to. Can we count on you? for? If that's you, I'm going to invite you. Come out from your seat. Come to this altar and say, God, all that I am, all that I have. God, whatever I know, whatever I, little I know, whatever little I can do, count with me. Come on, guys.